OK, how do we reflect on quizzes? Uh, what you do when you uh, um, go to the IPC 144's GitHub organization, you will see that there is one called IPC workshops. Do not go to BTP. They are a different subject. The assignments are very similar, but those are for a uh, bachelor's degree program. They're not diploma. OK, so IPC workshops are, are where, where, where you go to. Then when you go to IPC workshops, you will see that there are a series of workshops over here. It says workshop one released, workshop two released. So you can kind of work ahead of the time if you want to. You open up the workshop. There's a PDF file over there. You can, if you clone this, we talked about it, and you have the videos online, you know how to clone this using GitHub, using Git. You can watch the video there. The first three videos in the, uh, in the videos that we have for this uh, subject. So if you look at them, you'll see. If you clone it, then every single time a new workshop is done, you simply pull the changes, and new workshop's going to come to your repository. Or you can just open it up on this one. So it has two sections, in lab and at home. In lab will be done uh, in our lab to, the day after tomorrow that you're coming. And by the end of the lab, it has to be done and submitted. OK? Then at home time is kind of spices and herbs on it. And then you do some modifications, and you add some bells and whistles to it. And that becomes the at home version that you have five days to hand in, two days before your next workshop. That's the standard rule unless I, express, I mention otherwise. So that's why it happens. The, the at-home ones, you go do it at your own time, finish it, and you submit it. Um, all the submissions are done through the submitter program, as I mentioned before, through Matrix. So all the new students, please make sure you have your Matrix account. You've got to log in to matrix.senecacollege.ca. So I should have mentioned uh, in the thing to, uh, did I mention in the first uh, email that I sent you to download PuTTY? Or I did not? OK, so I'm mentioning it right now. Probably I'm going to fire up a, a, another notification. Uh, PuTTY is a very simple console app, a very simple terminal. It doesn't need installation. It's just an executable that you download. So download PuTTY. Party. <laughs> No, it actually recognizes it well. Download the party. Okay, so download party. And uh, so if you go to download party, party.org, um, you can download party here. And it essentially asks you what kind of operating system you have. You can get the installation, either 32 or 64. If you don't know what it is, watch the videos I explain exactly. And you just download and install it. And what you are going to get will be this. OK, where you can connect to remote Linux machines. Now, if you are already a Linux owner, you know that your machine have an IP. You can put that IP and remotely connect to it if you know what the IP is from anywhere in the world. Linux was like that since day one. OK, so now we have this big machine. As I mentioned, the name is Matrix. It's a cluster of hundreds, tens of machines. And together, they work like one machine. So they're very, it's very powerful. That's why all students in Seneca, they have accounts on it, and you can run stuff on it. So make sure you have a Matrix account. So essentially, open PuTTY over here and type Matrix. That's a little too big. Matrix Seneca College CA. And hit Enter. It has to be SSH. And open it up. And you'll see this comes in login as. Then put your Seneca email ID in there. Whatever it is. In my case, let's say I'm going to put over here F. Soleimanlu. That is my student, account, student ID. Okay? Not far out. That's Soleimanlu. That's my. So I hit enter. Then it's going to ask for the password. It tells you all the thingies and it asks you what the password. That's the password that you connect your email with. It's, they're all the same. No difference. And when you type, nothing will appear over there because it's a password. You shouldn't be able to see it. And when this prompt sign, the dollar sign, comes along, that means you are in matrix right now, and you can start doing work. OK? The first thing that you do when you get to matrix 
is to organize stuff. It, did they teach you in ULI how to create directories and stuff? Beautiful. So don't be messy. Create a directory for your IPC 144 and then create subdirectories over there. And always ask your ULI teacher. If your ULI teacher is telling you, teaching you how to modify your profile, okay? What is a profile? It's, called, it's a file called dot .profile, dot .bash profile, depending on what you're on. When you log in, as soon as I log in, the first thing that happens, Matrix runs your profile. So it sets up your account the way it's supposed to be. If you go over there and do stuff so your prompt changes and things that you do change, it's possible that the submitter program won't work. If you are doing, if you are modifying your dot profile that changes the behavior of the console, then you should have a backup to be able to put it back the way it was. Ask your teacher in ULI, how can I make sure that my matrix command prompts behavior doesn't change because we submit our C programs using matrix and if that doesn't work, uh, our program cannot get submitted properly. What happens is that if you don't do that, if you do stuff so every time a new prompt comes up, it shows something extra that is not supposed to, when you submit your program, when your program gets executed, those things are going to appear. And if they appear, my program is not intelligent enough. It checks the output and it says it's different, it says it's wrong. Because you print a date over here, for example, or printed hee -haw at the at every time you want. So things like that. So you got to make sure that you don't do that. Anyways, so this comes up. Back to workshops. It tells you what the learning outcomes are. Submission policy. Read this carefully. It's very important. Okay. And then it says what is the lab. So 30% is for the lab. You do the in-lab. And when you're done, it it goes through Visual Studio how to do all these things. We have done it in the first lab. So you know what it is. You kind of are ahead of the game over here. And the same thing for the matrix remote host to shows you all, all the stuff. And uh, uh, you gotta create a program that types star, 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 space, welcome, space, two, space, C, space, programming, space, star, 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 and new line. That's what it is, okay? The reason that I mentioned it that way is that if you don't put a st space over here, it won't submit it because it's a wrong thing to submit, okay? Got to be careful. It's very programming language. Programming is like that. It's very precise. When we ask you to draw a table, and in that table we want every cell of the table to be four characters long, you will say, "I think five is better." You put that one. It's not going to accept it. Okay. It has to be exactly uh, how they are explaining to you. So after you're done with all those things, the in-lab submission happens like this. You see this tilde prof name dot prof last name slash submit and 144w1lab. So you replace this prof name and prof last name with mine. My sincere apologies, I wish it was easy to change names, but you know, my name is long and, and difficult, but that's what you, ask your uh, ULI uh, prof, how can you create a, a shortcut for that? So you can simply say submit, and when you say submit, it does that for you. You can actually write a script that does that. But anyways. So, so you do submit and you put this in front of it. As soon as you put this little thing in front of it, it automatically knows that the name of the file is supposed to be that. So if the file name you have on matrix is not that, it's not going to submit it. So essentially you do, you do your work, you put it on matrix and you submit it that way. Okay, and it's going to submit it to me through an email, tell me when you submitted it, was the submit successful or not, and the, all the things that I need to know about your program. That does not answer the lady's question, how do we reflect? That's where I'm going to, okay? When you get to the at home part, that is another 30% for you, okay? At submission, you have always an extra file over here called reflect.txt, all right? Now, reflect.txt, you are supposed to reflect on What does it say what to do? In, there you go. In three to four sentences, describe your own what you've learned in completing the workshop in the text file name, you reflect that TXT. So now it's a very simple one. You're just going to mention what you learned. I learned to do work with Visual Studio. I learned how to do this, do that. I found out my teacher is a very bad person. I don't want to think, whatever you want to do. And it's, believe me, I'm not going to get any offense if you put over here something 
that you say, Farnad, you did this and I don't like it. Please make us like, give me suggestions. I guarantee worst thing you mention over here, I'm going to love you more. I'm telling you. That's, it's, it's, I'm telling you, I don't care. It's, I'm, I'm trying to make things better. So you can even do that, okay? But minimum thing that you need to do is to answer the questions that is in your reflection. Now, next time, it's going to be more precise. It's going to tell you, what is this? What is that? So you're going to answer five questions. And that's going to be that. But one thing that you add to these things that is not mentioned over here, that is, and, I, and I explained it's on a GitHub first page that you see, um, <clears throat> uh, that is a reflection for your quizzes. So to that reflect.txt, to that reflect.txt, quiz reflection, okay? In all the at-home part of your workshops, add a section to reflect.txt called quiz x reflection, replace x with the number of the last quiz that you have done. Or if you missed the reflection, mention over there re uh, reflection for quiz two and three, okay? So I know if you missed something, all right? And you write the reflection like that, um, and, and you, under that part, you write all the correct answers. So you're gonna mention question number three, the question was this, I answered this that was wrong, and the correct answer is this one. So you put the question, you put the wrong answer that you put, and the right answer, all right? And that gives you your mark back, all right? And that's that. I will add this one, sources.txt, so when you are submitting your at home, although it doesn't mention, it might look for sources.txt, okay? In sources.txt, you're going to explain if you have copied anything from anyone. Again, I'm mentioning it for a second time. Extremely important. Make sure if you have copied or got help from anyone that makes your code very similar to someone else. If someone else just kept, helped you and you came up with your own answer, you don't need to cite anything. You did it yourself. Thank you very much. But if your answer is very close to theirs, you have to give them the credit. Okay? You're not going to lose the whole mark. Again, I told you, instead of 100%, you're going to get 90. Or if it's too very, like, humongous amount of help, you're going to get 75. You're going to get 80. You're not, going to, you're not going to get zero. If you don't mention it, then that's going to be another story. All right? That's that. Uh, any questions? Suggestions? Objections? Yes. Pardon me? They're all on a matrix. So when you are submitting your at home, you simply add it through to, to the at home, to the reflect file.txt when you're submitting your at home version of the workshop. Okay? So if something happens and I did not give your quiz back on time, because they're like, what, like 70 things that I have to mark. If I don't get enough time, it doesn't matter. You can do the reflection with the next one. Okay? Any questions? Uh, so, you got your quiz, the at home of the next workshop. Always. Okay? I, unless you have a reason for it not to. Like if something happens and you can't. Are we okay? All right. So, again, install putty that's good for your health. So like every single session that we have, I'm going to create a, a console application with Visual Studio, and I'm going to use that to teach. Okay, so all the examples that I give you, I'll put it right in here. So you'll see how things are happening. Now, uh, for the first few times, I'm going to create the, uh, the, so the project over here so you can see over and over and learn. But then, hopefully, if I can prepare things ahead of the time, I'm going to come with a project that is already created. So to create a, a Windows console application, uh, you can always go to the last, because you see it says Windows Desktop Wizard. The recent project templates that you use, it puts it over here. You can use that one if you're at home, but at school, because every single time it resets, that is not there. So you go File, New, Project, or Control-Shift-N. 
out of all the stuff that are listed over there, you select Visual C++, Windows Desktop, and Windows Desktop Wizard. No other way of creating a project is acceptable because it's going to create extra stuff that you don't want to see. And the outcomes are not going to be the same. So Windows Desktop Wizard. Then browse to the directory that, what you want, that you want to create. Now, in this case that we are in right now, we, I am going to create it in SHH. That is you guys, right? So it's going to be an SHH directory. I'll make sure that create directory for solution is unchecked so it doesn't create extra nested uh, things that we don't need. And now I am creating the first, uh, the, the second project during my lecture. So I'm going to start it with 02 dash. And this is April 15th, so I'm going to put over here. Is it April? May 15th, right? May 15th. It's May 15th, so May 15th. OK. And I'm going to click on OK. Then this opens. First, everything should be unchecked. Don't first check this one and then. OK. First, uncheck and then check the empty project. And then click on OK. And three years later, a project will, be get, will get created for you. An empty project. It does nothing. It has nothing absolutely in it. And because of last time I closed everything, I only have the Solution Explorer open. You don't need to have anything else open other than Solution Explorer. To start programming, I'm going to right click on Source Files, Add, New Item, or I can hit Control Shift A. That is adding a new item. Now I want to create code, and it's going to be a C++ code, but not C++, C. So I'm going to call it prg.c. And prg.c is what I create. If I want to know where my code got created, I right-click on the name of the project, whatever it is, and I'm going to say Open in File Explorer, and that's going to open it in the file explorer when I wanted to, so I can see where everything's created. Are we okay down to here? <clears throat> then, uh, to begin writing a C program, you need to do two important things. First, at the top, write, define, with hashtag at the beginning, you are to, again, when you put hashtag, when you put number sign at the beginning of the line in a C program, it means you are not writing a C program. You are talking to the compiler, telling the compiler to do something before compilation. Okay? So I'm saying, compiler, I don't want any warnings for the CRT security stuff. Okay? And that's underline CRT, underline secure, underline no underline warnings. Okay? That lets you use functions for I.O. in C language. Then you got to include standard input output library, which are all the stuff that you want to read. OK? You want to get from the, I'm uh, oh, sorry, uh, that is all the functions for input and output. Uh, for now, we're going to just use two of them, but later on, you're going to learn more. The two functions that we are going to use are the most powerful ones. They can get any type of entry, OK, depending on uh, what kind of a uh, thing you request. So these functions, they are, they are called formatted functions. So it's either, either scan formatted or print formatted. Scan formatted scans from your keyboard. So scans the entry that you have for information that you want to get, depending on what you ask for it. They can get integers, they can get uh, real numbers, they can get uh, um, strings, Characters, different shapes and type of things. Okay, we're going to learn how later. Uh, so uh, to write an empty program that does nothing, we start it with a function called main. Int main, and in, uh, the entrance of the function, the mouth of the function that accepts things, is void, which means that function does not receive anything from any other function, and returns zero. Now. We're going to learn later on that functions that you write, they can communicate with each other. You can write 50 different functions and break your task into pieces to make your life easier. For now, we are just writing, implementing one necessary mandatory function that we have to have in every C program, and that pro function is called main. Why it's called main? Because 
C is language of functions. You will literally write hundreds of functions to uh, implement one solution for something. Now, how does C know which function begins everything? When you have 50 different functions, how does it know which one starts everything? Because of that, you can use any name for any function, but there is one name that, you, that is reserved in C language, no matter what you include or not include, and that's main. So if you call the function main, that that function returns an integer, receives nothing, that function is essentially where everything begins, okay? And this is an empty program. I can just run it and see how it works. How do I run it? I go to debug, and I'm going to say, start without debugging, which means execute, run, compile. It means check for its syntax errors. Compile. If everything's okay, execute, show me how it works. Okay? This is an ID. It does all these good stuff all together. So I'll go start without debugging, and ta -ta 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 -ta, goes through it 50 years later. It's going to show you a window that says, press any key to continue. It did nothing because I didn't do anything, right? Are we okay? All right. All right. And now. We talked about computers, we talked about uh, information. We said that information are two different types. Uh, we have information that are raw information that we analyze and do things with. And we gave you an example. I said we want to have the average mark for a test in a class. So what happens, we write we want the name of the students and the mark they got. So we go through the mark of all the students, or actually we don't even need their names, we just need their marks. We get the marks of all the students, we give it to the program, program goes through all of them, adds them all up, divides it by the number of the tests, and it tells you the average of the test is that much, okay? So these data, these numbers that you provide for that program, this is one type of information, raw data. That programs process to do what they're supposed to do my cell phone. I open it up, I put a phone number in there, and I hit dial. That phone number is the data that my phone program is using. If I put a different phone number, someone else is going to be called, right? So that 10-digit number that I put over there, that's the data that I was talking about. This is the raw data that you give to programs to process. That is, this is one type of data, information. The second type of information is the program itself. The phone, the phone that you have, and in that phone of yours, where's my phone? There you go. So the phone that you have, when you're actually dealing with your phone, this program itself, it's written in a language, some language, we don't care what, that you can actually dial stuff on, right? This program, it's written and compiled and the executable is sitting on my phone. Therefore, you can call someone with. That information is inside the computer too, right? That's information too. So we have two types of information. We have data and we have programs. Programs are information too, but they are instructions, okay? So we have instructions, we have data. Data are raw information. Instructions are what data uses. Now, what type of information I have over here? instructions, right? This is not raw data. Do we understand this? This is, although it sounds, of course, to everyone when I talk about it, but this is something that we know, we need to know right from the beginning. Now, the basis of computers are built on switches, on very, very tiny little, little switches. That's how computers remember how things and what things are. Again, what I talk about right now are very primitive stuff. I am literally telling you 1 plus 1 is 2. Hence, we are going to Mars. Okay? That's how far the, the relation between that program that dialed the number and what I'm talking about right now, that the relationship between the two. So it's that basic. I'm literally telling you what is 1 plus 1 now. Okay? So uh, lots of people... 
including myself, when I was studying, I was always eager to see how can I apply this thing to something? How can I apply? It's gonna, the time's gonna come, but you have to be patient, right? It's the, it's the beginning. Let me pause the recording. So, a traffic light, when you get to it, and you want to walk through the street and pass through it, right? Uh, when you look at, uh, how do you know if you can cross the street? Okay, let's go. How do you know if you can cross the street? <laughs> gonna, uh, don't play with me, I'm not in kindergarten. But, but sorry about that. How do we know if we pass the street? How do we know? Screen, it's green. How do we know we are not supposed to pass the street? When it's turned red. When it's turned red. So do, can they turn those lights to be ye yellow? They can't, right? They're all the, either green or red. They cannot be any other color. I'm not talking about the three thingy that you have, we are you're talking about passing that. Look. So they're either go or stop, right? Only two different possibilities, right? That's how everything is kept in a computer. Uh, you can see it in, in every single thing that you see around you. We had this a long time. On? Oh, by the way, anybody sensitive to that? Lights going off and on? No? Good. Pause recording. So when I turn that uh, light on and off, okay, that's off and on, okay? I always tell to everybody, like, when you're passing by my office, take a look. If the light is on, I'm there. If it's off, either I'm busy or I'm not in, <laughs> okay? So if you pass around my office and you see the light is off and I'm sitting over there working, it means don't bother me, I'm working, okay? Um, of course, that doesn't happen during the office hours, but, but anyways. So keep that in mind, all right? This is something that we have to understand, the switch on or off, okay? They, mathematicians love to tie everything to, to mathematics. They say, oh, that's the number to me. Okay, zero means nothing and one is on, right? That's what they went through, okay? Okay, so I ha can have two digits, zero or one. That's beautiful. Now, uh, what if I want to have more? So I'm gonna put two switches beside each other. Now, if I have two switches, how many different positions these two, two switches can get? One, two, three, four, correct? One, two, three, four, correct? Four different, four different positions. Now, what if I have three? Eight. Two to power? Three, right? What if I have four? Sixteen. Okay, so that's how I have. So, so essentially, it started actually calling, started, did they talk about this in, that in ULI, binary stuff? Not yet? Okay, so that's how it happens. So they essentially said we can actually, we can actually put any number that you want in binary. We could do that, there's no problem. If I want to do something binary, I can do it easily. So I can have zeros and ones. Um, and uh, I am not the best uh, in handling mice on the thing it, 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 and, and drawing, you'll see. So when I say over here zero, sorry for that zero. <laughs> So zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. This is essentially the number of switches that I have, okay? So now in this case, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, correct? Uh, is it seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven different switches. Okay, now how many different positions, seven different, seven switches take? It's two to power seven. One is two, two is four, three goes eight, 16, 32, 64, 127. 127 numbers, so it starts from zero, goes up to 120, 127. It's 128. But 127, 0 to 127 positions. Okay, I have to, something that you have to know. How many fingers? Ten. 0 to 9. Remember that, okay? Okay, remember that. It's very important. This is something that we're going to deal with in arrays a lot, okay? How many fingers? 10, 0 to 9. So, <clears throat> so I can start from 0 and go up to 127 with 7 bits, right? They did that and it worked. They say, okay, so we're going to actually tag all the alphabet and stuff that we have with that. 
So they put seven things long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And then they said, okay, seven is not symmetrical. Like, if I want to cut it in half, where do I put the four, where do I put the three? So let's just add one to it, and it becomes a 256. I have some, I have some extra. At the time, they wouldn't think they are like 9,000 languages on a planet. So they just were thinking English, right? So they said, okay, that, that's fair enough. 256 can get all the alphabet notation, notations, all the little things that we have, a little bit more of graphics and stuff like that. So that's how they did it. So essentially, they put eight bits in a byte, and each byte now can go from zero up to no, no. Seven bits goes from zero up to 128. Sorry, yeah. 250, five. five. 200, so I can show zero to 255. Okay? And that became the smallest thing that you can have in a computer to hold a number. So a byte that you see is essentially a collection of eight switches that they flip it in different ways, and you can hold an integer that is 0 up to 255, and not more than that. So if you put 256 in it, what's going to happen? The answer is, the best thing is that I don't know. What happens if I have, may I touch this? OK. OK. Yes, that's OK. I don't want to drink it. Just want to. OK, so this is a medium cup of coffee, right? All right. What happens if I actually put a large amount of coffee in here? Overflow. Overflow, right? That's what happens. So you should mention, like, what happens, you should not predict. If somebody's doing foolish and is foolish enough to put a, you know, large amount of coffee into a medium, let them burn. Okay? So that's, that's what we've got to do. So it overflows. All right? Now, if I want numbers bigger than that, I can put two bytes back to back. So I'm going to have 16 bits now. I'm going to go up to what? 64,000 different positions, right? Correct? So that's much bigger. 2 to power 16. If I want to even make that bigger, I can double that to 4 integers. That's 2 to power 32 around like, what, 4 billion? 2 billion? I don't know. Find out how many. It's actually, you actually have it in those thinking. Okay, I'm not going to ask you what it is, but just go get the ballpark almost to see how, how big is it. We need to, okay. Uh, we don't need to know the exact number, but it's a good idea just to know almost how big they, they are going to be. Now, huh. they have done this, and uh, they, now they can keep numbers in, the, uh, in, in these bytes, and from there, the sky is the limit. You keep putting, you, you, you make something simple. That's how everything happened. So they wrote very simple programs. Okay? Programs. That z at the end was very important. So they had, and then they wrote 10 programs, simple programs. They put it together. It became a little more complicated program. And then they, those tens of those little more complicated programs made it a little more complicated. Then hundreds of those together, and then thousands of those, and you have your cell phone with you. Okay? So all those simple calculations, they build up together, and they built this humongous thing. So essentially, for our primitive brain, it's extremely difficult to find out what exactly goes in this thing deep to the bits. If we are lucky, we get specialized in one feature of it, either low level, high level, I don't know. But no one, unless you are an extremely genius person, can code low-level CPU stuff, and at the same time, go write uh, an accounting program. They don't go together. It's too big of a stone to pick. It's too heavy of a stone to pick. That's why it's broken down into pieces, okay? And that's why we are learning it like this. I hope it, it kind of gave you an idea where everything began and how the computers work now, okay? So what you do right now, what you do right now is essentially... writing code that brings up hundreds of those complicated things that were designed before, that builds your program. All right? Now, in these type of applications that are created, they had to show those numbers somehow. They, as I mentioned, you write something over here, 
it gets translated using a compiler to those 55,000 different simple things down there, right? But how to actually show the data over here? When you are showing an integer, it's pretty simple and straightforward. An integer can sh be shown over here, just a regular integer. <clears throat> so one, two, three, four, okay? All right? But when hackers want to actually sit over there and look at the content of the memory, what do they have? They have ones and zeros, right? So the pattern of the byte that you are looking at, if they are looking at zero, 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 one, zero, if they are looking at zero, zero, one, zero, what number are they seeing? Zero, zero, num, zero? No, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, that's not two. Two is one, zero. We have zero, see, this is zero. This is zero, this is one, this is two, this is three, and this is four. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Another finger. <laughs> this is four, okay? So this is four. So that's how it goes. So essentially, zero, zero, one is four. See, that's very difficult to grasp, okay? So they said, hey, this is just driving me nuts, putting one, two, three, four, five like human beings. I have to, tr I have to be able to implement some kind of a numbering system that fits these ones and zeros. Now, a byte is eight bits, correct? Half a byte is four bits, correct? Now, four bits, it's two to power four, that is 16. So it starts from zero, goes up to 15, correct? So they said, if I be able to, just assume a human being has eight fingers in each hand instead of five, then we didn't have 10, right? We had 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And after 9, we had another digit. So they invented that. They said we can say A. So 9A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 0. 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, 1, 7, 1, 8, 1, 9, 1, A, 1, B, 1, C. Don't say 10 because it's not 10 anymore. It's base 16. Okay, so they did that and they called that hexadecimal. Why? Because with two digits, you can show content of a byte exactly. If you write AB, AB is two four bits, right? That means one byte. That's how hexadecimal came to be. And because of that fact, you can actually use hexadecimal over here. So if I actually write over here like this, 0x10, if I write that, that's not 10 anymore. What is that? 16. OK? That's in base 10, base, uh, base 16, right? So what is in base? OK, when you are dealing with, when you're dealing with regular numbers, when I write over here 125, I have a 5, right? Then I have 2 multiplied by 10. Then I have 1 multiplied by 100. Is that correct? Correct? So essentially, I have 5 multiplied by 10 to power 0. I have 2 multiplied by 10 to power 1. And I have 1 multiplied by 10 to power 2. Is that correct? That's how it's done. So remove all these and make them 16. Then it becomes base 16. So 125 is not 125 anymore. Because 5 means 5. That's just essentially it's. So that's multiplied by 1. But 2 is multiplied by 32, by 16 now. So it becomes 32, essentially. So if I write hex 10, it means if I'm in base, 10, base 16, then I have over here 16 power 0. And this one is going to be multiplied by 16 to power 1, which means it's essentially 16 to the value. But again, in our C program, we don't need to understand that yet. We can do it later. In, in OP345, probably you're going to use these things when we are going to bitwise operators. We have nothing to do in IPC. Again, good to know at this moment. So we can show the literal values that we want in base, uh, in base 10, 1, 2, 3, in base hex, 0x, 2, 3, 4, it means I have 2 multiplied by 16 to power 2, 3 multiplied by 16, and 4 multiplied by 1. That's the value of the second one, right? 
And also, you can show things in base 8. OK? Why did I mention, pardon me? What's 0 times? It's, it's not times. It's? That means that's base 16. 0x means whatever comes after is base 60. Okay. Let me just make it right then. My apologies. You're absolutely right. 2ab. The digits are 2 and a and b. a is 1 after 9. And b is 2 after 9. Okay? It's digit b. Okay? It's because these are uh, base 16. Okay? Now, you can write it in base 8. Base 8 if, as if humans had four fingers in each hand. Okay, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 1, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, 1, 7, then 2, 0. Okay, you can do it that way. Why do I confuse the heck out of you out of this one is that if you start a number with 0, it becomes base 8. Be extremely careful. Lots of geeks want to, want to, like, they want just to be cool when they are writing. It's a two-digit number, so I'm going to write 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and then 0, 11, if I want to have it three digits. If you write 0, 11, it means 1, 8, and 1, 1, it means 9, actually. It doesn't mean 11. Okay? Careful. Do not start your numbers with 0 when you are writing literal values. Okay? That's that. Floating point numbers, we call it floating point numbers, real numbers. They are written exactly like what we have. And we don't have any hexadecimal schmesimal like that. There is no real number in a bit and byte. You cannot implement that. So that is a very complex calculation. To have 12.34, it's an extremely complicated uh, calculation in a computer's in a computer to actually make that happen. We write it in a program and it's masked by the by compiler. Compiler translates it to the machine code and it happens. But remember, it's not a cheap thing to use real numbers. They are very, very, very expensive uh, to process because computer has to do lots of extra steps to, to, to actually uh, accommodate that. And uh, all the graphics that happen, okay, they are extremely uh, uh, in, in need of uh, uh, real uh, uh, floating point calculations. That's how graphics work, okay? And because of that fact, uh, they are very expensive. And because of that fact, if you want to have a good game played, you need to put a graphics card on your computer. And that graphics card has 2,000 CPUs in it. You have one CPU on your machine, they have 2,000 small CPUs, job is only to calculate these things and draw polygons and stuff. So they actually do that. So it's a very uh, uh, complicated thing to do. Keep that in mind. Uh, we should avoid using real numbers as much as we can, but if we have to, then no problem. These days computers are very fast, so there's no problem with that. So we know all that. We talked about addresses, we know exactly what they are. We talked about compilers. We went through it. And uh, um, we know exactly how they work. Compilers are programs. We give them, uh, they are uh, applications to which we give them a programming, a written uh, algorithm, a written task in a programming language. It gets that one, checks it to make sure all the grammars and syntax is correct. If it's correct, then it compiles it and gives us an executable that is the equivalent of what we wrote in CPU language. Therefore, we can run it and do whatever we want to do with it. Okay? So those are compilers. And remember, C language is case sensitive. And let's have a break. We'll come back after the break. Okay, so when we talked about addresses and memory and stuff, we said that uh, memory is where we put everything in, right? Memory is where we have everything put in before we can do anything with it, okay? Um, and we talked about addresses, and we said address is the sequence number of a byte in memory. <clears throat> Most of this, addresses and stuff, you're gonna get involved with a little, but where to put stuff in a memory, you don't need to worry about. It, the, the programming language helps you with that. Very simple, in a very simple way. 
So the, what does the programming language do? In the programming language, you can specify names. You can specify names for the type of the things that you want to hold, and it's going to hold you for you. So it's going to kind of tag a piece of memory with that name, and you can put stuff in it. We call that, uh, we call those variables. Okay? So a variable can have a type. Now, we have two major types in C language. Remember that I told you the quiz is going to be on the things that uh, you don't know yet, and then you go, it's kind of halfway happening now. Because I'm talking about types and things like that, which is in second week, and you're going to have a quiz on tomorrow. But I'm not going to cover the whole thing, okay? So, again, read the whole thing, complete my, my lecture, and then the, so half of the stuff I'm going to talk about after the quiz and half before. Therefore, uh, it's happening, kind of. Anyways, so types are things, types, uh, uh, variables are things in which we put numbers, okay? And we have to decide what type of a number we want to put. Two things we have to decide. What is the type of the number, okay? Number two is what is its size, okay? So there are two major types that we have real numbers and we have integrals, okay? And this is math. <laughs> review. Okay? I'm going to go back, forward. In computers, we have two different types. We have integers, we have floating point numbers. Okay? Integers, floating points, integrals, and real numbers. Okay, so now, 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 these two different types that are integers and floating points, they, they are categorized uh, in different sizes. So if I want to talk about integers, the smallest integer that I want to put a number in, you already know. What is that type? What is the smallest size of, its smallest unit of memory? What is the smallest addressable unit of memory? Byte. Bit is not addressable. Bit is something that is hidden from us. We know that is a, a byte is made up of a bit, but for us, even for computer, there is no such, bit, such, such thing as bit. The computer itself doesn't know that there is such thing of a bit. Computer knows, so the computer knows that there is a byte that can go from 0 up to 255. That's all it does. That, that's all it knows. Okay? So the smallest thing that I can have is a byte, right? And how did that byte come to being? Remember the story that I told you? They wanted to tag alphabet with, tag characters with. That's what they, it drove them to the size of eight bits, because that was big enough to hold, uh, to tag all the variables. So numbers, so 65, for example, is capital A. 92 is lowercase a. They tag numbers, okay? And they saw the number is getting yay big, and they, they create that byte for it. That byte in C language, so the smallest integer you can put in C language is actually called char. <laughs> they actually call it char. Char, although it's big enough. Why they call it character? Because that integer is big enough to hold the code of a letter. Okay, code of a character. That code of a character, by the way, is called ASCII. Okay, ASCII code, they call it. Like, if you Google ASCII code, it's going to come up. You're going to see exactly what an ASCII code is. <laughs> ASCII table. There you go. Ta-da! Let's bring one up. That's the ASCII table. You see that? So... Uh, that's hex, this, this is decimal, you see, you see that's decimal, hex, oct, we need decimal, so let's, and this is the actual character. So if we come over here, space is 32, you see that, a is 65, lowercase a is actually 97, I said 92, so 92 is essentially backslash, I made a mistake. You see that, nobody memorizes unless you are an you know, assembly program or a hacker, you want to know what the... Maybe I knew it the first 10 years that I programmed, but when it reached 30, I forgot everything. So what I'm saying is that 
what, what I'm saying is that because of this, uh, they call that a character. So if you want to create a character and you want to put a name on it, then I'm going to call it character and I'm going to call it ch. So ch is the name of a variable that I can hold a number that is starting from 0 going up to 255, correct? Incorrect. I lied to you. How many fingers? 0 to 9, right? This is only if I want to tag positive numbers, correct? Now, how many fingers? 10. What if I want to include negative numbers too? Where should I start from? Minus what? Minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 3, 4, 5. So you came up with that thing, right? So your integers are one more than negative number, right? Wrong. They did it the other way. They actually put the zero on the positive side. So your negative number is always one more. Minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four. Okay? So a character that you put over here starts from minus 128, goes up to positive 127. Okay? That's how they did it. Okay? So remember that. So the character that you see is like that. Then, then they said, okay, but that's, that's for a character. I want to hold an integer. I want to hold a number in it and do math with it, do something with it. If I want to hold a number, what do I call the smallest integer that I can put? The smallest integer is a character. Minus 127 up to 128 up to 127. One, one bigger than that is called a short integer. Okay? Short integer, I'm going to call it SH. That can go from minus 32,000 up to positive 32,000. It's not exactly 32. It's 32 yada 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 that I don't know. What? You have it over there? What? 32,768 positive and 32, seven, uh, negative and 32,797 positive. Okay? Right? And after that, you have an integer. It's actually an int, and I'm going to call it i. i can go from yeah, the other, <laughs> minus, oh. minus, there you go, minus 2 billion up to positive 2 billion. Okay? And then after that, so this is 1 byte, this is 2 bytes, and this is 4 bytes, right? And then they created long. It looks like long is supposed to be 8 bytes, right? It's not actually. For some reason that I cannot tell you right now, okay, long and int are the same ties. So when I say long L, that's actually four bytes too. Okay? Pardon me? What do you mean by four bytes? Four bytes? It means four bytes. It means, it means 32 bits. It means 2 to power 32. That becomes a... Yeah, yeah. So that's the size, actually, the size of the things that we're going to put over there. And then they say, what if I want to have numbers bigger than 2 billion? Exactly. They call it long, long. Long, long. That's actually something new. It wasn't there before. So I'm going to call it LL. You never caught an LL. You actually put something. Now, if you want to make it longer than that, what do you do? Long, long. No, I'm kidding. I was... <laughs> Or was it long, 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 long? No, <laughs> that's it. That's the end of it. Okay, so that's it. That, these are all the integers that you have in C language. Okay, one character, sorry, one byte, two bytes, four bytes, four bytes, and eight bytes. And that's what it is. Yes. Pardon me? No, 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 no. no. Don't listen to him. Okay, okay. Shh. All right, that's all we have. Okay, these are standard C. Why they are the same? Yeah. Okay. Long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> computers, the CPU of a computer, were designed in a way that uh, the fetch width, the, the width of the standard size for an integer in a CPU was only 16 bytes. Okay? 16 bits. Okay? 
16-bit processors. Then they became 32-bit processors. Then they became 68-bit processors. Hence, you see 32-bit, 64-bit operating systems. For You hear that? That's the size that the CPU can digest as a whole. Okay? Now, int was a standard integer. It was a standard int. Int was mentioned to be the number that CPU understand as a whole. And it was two bytes long time ago in C because CPUs were 16-bit. So short int and int were the same because they said no matter what's going to happen, int is going to be standard thing for a CPU. Then CPUs became 32-bit, hence the integers became 32-bit, and it, it became the same thing as a long, right? But they stopped it over there. They didn't carry it to 64. So that's why now long and int are the same. It wasn't the same before. Like, I remember that I, but that shows how old I am. When I was doing, I, I remember I was doing C programs that an int was actually two bytes, not four. Okay? So that was the reason. Now you ask, now you know. And sorry about all the irrelevant mumbling that I did, but that's, that's what it is. So just remember, int and long and now the same. In size, not in type. Okay? They are still the same types. Okay, but they are, they, are, they are identical types with different names, okay? <laughs> you have to respect that they are different in name, <laughs> all right? And then they fit floating point numbers. Floating point numbers are to keep values that they have partial things. If you put in an integer 2.5, if you say put 2.5 in i, what's going to go in i? 2, because that's the... That's the integer part of 2.5, two, 2 right? What if you put 2.999? Also 2, because partial thing is 999. What if you put 2.00001? Still 2. It doesn't care. It doesn't round it up. Again, it's computer. It's dumb. When you put a floating point in an integer, it doesn't see a floating point. It just picks the integer part. Are we OK with this? All right. Now, with floating point, they started with the type float, okay? Now, a float number, type float, holds floating point numbers, um, but it only say, let's say it goes up to four digits after the decimal point. It means I can put 1.1234, 1 let's say, okay? I'm just giving you, so to speak, okay? Four digits after that. Then they saw they want to do calculations that the precision is not enough. They need to go more after the decimal point. They said, what if we double the precision? And they did. So they call it a double now. So double has more precision than float. And then they said, I want even more precise precision than that. What do we call it? They didn't call it, wanted to call double double because it's already uh, registered by Tim Hortons. So they actually <laughs> called it long double. Okay? So long double is essentially the most precise floating point number that we have. Okay? But again, these are not precise. Remember that. Something that you need to remember, I'm going to tell you right now, and remember till the day you die, is that when you do calculations with double numbers, and the logic dictates that the outcome of the two calculations are both 1.234, if you compare the two in the program, you may get inequality. Because the precision is not high, when you put one point, or if you have two calculations with no, double numbers, and the outcome, when you follow, it's obviously they are both four. Well, when you compare the two, it says they are, they are not equal. Why? Because one is four, and the other one is 3.999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
comparing double values, you have to always check the difference. Reduce one by the other and look at the difference. If the absolute value of the, I lost everyone when I said absolute value, didn't I? If the difference between the two is smaller than certain value, it means you're good. Okay, remember with double values, you can't go. They are, they have precision, but they are not absolute. Absolute values are in integers. Integers, when it's five, it's five. It cannot be six. What with double a two can't be 1.9999999 or 2.0000001. Okay? Are we okay with that? All right. And these things are variables, and the variables that you have over here are someplace in memory. Uh, you can put stuff in it and do whatever you want to do with it. So, um, uh, types.c. <clears throat> so I can say integer num. And I, can, and I can set that integer to 10, which means n I have put the literal value 10 in num. And now num is 10. Are we OK with this? All right. <clears throat> Calculations in computers are not like mathematics. Uh, in mathematics, when you put equality, that's a statement you are making, not request for an action. When I say y is equal to x, it means y and x have same values, correct? In mathematics, such expression is invalid. Correct? Because in mathematics, you are, making an ex you are making a statement. You are saying num is equal to num one one. And you're going to say, I've got to say num goes with num. Zero is equal to one. What the heck are you are talking about? Right? It's not in, in, in computer science. An assignment is a request for an action, which means you are asking the compiler to compile the right to. You're asking the CPU to calculate the right-hand side and set the left-hand side to the, right, to the outcome of right-hand side. Knowing that, at line 7, what is the value of num? Exactly. Remember about placeholders? Therefore, if I run this beautiful program of mine, three years later, you will see that the value that is going to come out is 11. Are we okay with this? All right. All right, so what are the expressions that we can use? First of all, you understand what assignment is. Assignment doesn't mean check for equality. It doesn't mean that. Assignment means do something. Set something to me, for me. Set, calculate what's at right-hand side and put it at left-hand side. What are the things that we can do? I can do multiply, I can do again. I can do uh, addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, and modulus, which means the uh, remainder of the, of the division, okay? These are the four things that I can do. And these are, uh, uh, the first four are for uh, integers. So I can say, <clears throat> oh, variable declaration must be done at the beginning of a block. Where is the beginning of the rock? Wherever you have an open curly bracket. In C language, any place you have an open curly bracket, immediately after you can create your variables. That's the rule. Don't ask me why. And the corresponding closed curly bracket is the end of the life for that. OK? Remember that. So when the closed curly bracket reaches, num dies, and whatever was inside of it. And it's not accessible anymore. And that num is only accessible in its own what we call scope. Scope is essentially the block in which you create the variable. OK? So that num has only meaning from line 4 to line 10 and nowhere else. 
Are we okay? So I can have, have, have over here um, integer a, ten, um, 5, integer b, 6, and I can have num a plus b, right? And all the other things, a minus b, multiply by b, and divided by b. Okay? And the outcome of all these things are integer values. What is a? What is b? What is 5 divided by 6? 0. If there is no partial. If it was a floating point number, then I, then I have to sit over there and do the math. But when it's an integer, you don't even think. The outcome, the partial goes to garbage. It's 0. So now if I have over here 15, now I can say something. Now I can say, okay, a plus b over here is 21. a minus b over here is what? 9. a multiplied by, I keep, I keep going like that. Now a divided by b, a divided by b is, how many 6 I have in 15? 2. two. It's 2. 2 point? No, 2 only. All right? And, there is, and these work exactly for floating point numbers too. But the difference is that with floating point numbers, partials are calculated too. So if I have 3 divided by 2, the result will be 1.5. Okay? But 3 divided by 2 is an integer is... Right? Okay. Now, time is 3.15, which means I went just a little bit into... Uh, types and things like that. So um, uh, we'll uh, continue the rest next time. Let me just stop the thing.